First of all, thank you everyone for coming. Please stand. Hello, welcome to Cleveland. Uh, it's a great sunny day here in Cleveland and every year that we've held this event, it's been this kind of day. So I think it really um, speaks to a great start for your careers in biomedical research. Welcome to the ninth annual Seeds of Discovery White Coat Ceremony. 
We have representations from all corners of the United States, California, Arizona, Maryland, Ohio, Michigan, New York, many others. We also have a nice international representation today. We have students from India, Uganda, Ghana, Iran, China, Korea, Egypt, and Brazil. Many great institutions across the, this country and around, around the world. So I'm Marvin Neiman. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for Graduate Education here at School of Medicine. It is an honor for me to host this event, the Seeds of Discovery White Coat Ceremony. White coat ceremonies are commonplace and a steep tradition in medical school as students start their medical training. Very few institutions have an event such as this for the graduate program. So we're truly lucky to be here uh, today and have the school, the dean, the department chairs, the faculty, and the program directors all excited and to support this event every year. Um, we, we, we have a great turnout and it's a great opportunity for us to welcome you to uh, Case Western Reserve. This tradition has started uh, nine years ago, uh, and it's a fantastic way for you to begin your, your career uh, as a biomedical researcher. So you may be thinking, I'm not starting my career. I'm just starting my rotations. I don't know what project I'm going to do. I don't even know what lab I'm going to be in. But your career has already started, and I think this is the beginning of it. And as you go through, you've already met some of your new colleagues your, uh, at some of the orientation events. Um, there's an event uh, tomorrow, uh, trip to Cedar Point. Thank you, Dr. Breuer. Uh, <clears throat> You are, as you go through your rotations, you're going to meet postdocs and senior students and, and faculty. These are all beginning your network. This is going to be your lifeline as you go through graduate school. You're going to have ups and downs with the experiment. These are all people you can turn to. So you're growing your network. Um, this is going to be essential as you move on into the, uh, your, as, your, as your career develops. So. On behalf of Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, I welcome you to Cleveland. It is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean, uh, Dr. Stan Gerson. He's the interim dean at the School of Medicine. Uh, dean Gerson is the Asa and Patrick Shiverick, and Jane Shiverick Tripp Professor of Hematological Oncology. He's also a Case Western Reserve University Distinguished University Professor. That's the highest honor given to a faculty. He's also the director of the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center and the director of the National Center of Regenerative Medicine. You can see he wears many hats, um, but this has actually gives him a wide perspective of what it means to be successful in biomedical research, whether it be basic translational research, uh, teaching, advo advocacy, community activism. Um, he has a wide appreciation for all of these endeavors, which all, some, some of this, many of you may go into different aspects of this as you get your PhD and move on in your career. In working with Dr. Gerson over the past year, I can attest that he's committed to graduate education. He's constantly pushing us to keep our programs excellent and keep them uh, up to date and so that we can train the scientists of the 21st century. Dr. Gerson. Let me uh, also welcome all of you both our newest trainees, families, friends, our faculty um, from all corners of uh, the city of Cleveland. Uh, one of the things I like to do is remind us all that there are over 3,500 faculty of the School of Medicine uh, here in the city of Cleveland across five institutions, including the uh, basic science programs of the school. And all of those individuals are at your behest as you go through your uh, training um, here with us. I'm really honored uh, to welcome this really outstanding class of new scientists and researchers to an extraordinary school which is really committed um, to your education. We're looking forward to that as you take the breadth of biomedical research under your wings, learn the disciplines of your interest, and collaborate as you possibly can. Uh, we have a mission here uh, at the school, and that's to improve global health by linking research to populations in a superb education environment. 
and I'm delighted with the breadth of our class uh, today and individuals that come from across the globe and will contribute to that improvement of global health in whatever discipline they participate in. So our job is to help you be part of that mission, um, going from basic concepts to discovery to application in an effort to include human health through understanding of disease, uh, developing a fundamental assessment of processes we don't yet understand, uh, models of disease, testing human samples, developing a new diagnostic, a new therapeutic, a new vaccine, uh, and the like. We also recognize the incredible breadth of opportunities that you have. No longer is it just that you should grow up like us, academic professors. You may decide to be involved in a bio biotech startup, to be in project management, to go into industry, to go into other forms of education. We're here to help you transition through that and have the impact that you importantly can have. Today uh, really points to an important milestone in your career, really because uh, uh, taking on this white coat, I'm wearing one today, is a symbol of your commitment uh, to this profession of biomedical science and impact on human health. After all, our physician colleagues know that they offer the best medicine of today. Your job is the best medicine for tomorrow. So why a white coat? Uh, hopefully yours won't remain white very long because we'll get it dirty. It's okay. Um, how you practice and what you decide is your field is up to you, but it's our intent to make sure that you appreciate that as a medical school, we really are interested in both health, uh, human benefits, and community impact. Now, we also have a strong program within our basic science groups um, uh, of a community-oriented research program, public health, uh, some population science. And one of the things that we're initiating now is a linkage between those two, what might have otherwise be seen as disparate fields. We want you to think about public and population health even if you're doing the most basic of science effort. Um, and as I think we've learned in this COVID era, that basic science turns out to have practical implications often faster than we can imagine. So you'll expect to have some fun, learn a huge amount, be continually excited, attending class, national meetings, networking with colleagues, making a difference, and given the breadth of backgrounds that you all have, returning some of that knowledge back to your own uh, community. So with that also comes a certain amount of responsibility, professionalism, integrity, honesty, validation, concepts, understanding of fairness in collaboration, recognition, respect for your fellow students, your colleagues, and your mentors. So one of the advantages that I mentioned in my first statements was around the fact that we have four outstanding medical centers joining us as a faculty of the School of Medicine. And so even though you may be spending your time in the classroom and in a laboratory, spend a little bit of time getting to know those hospitals. They can offer incredible opportunities for your research programs through collaborations and the like. And also the other schools. You'll see with us this afternoon uh, biomedical engineering, but also other uh, activities and scientists in the School of Engineering and Systems Biology, Computer Science, in the College of Arts and Sciences and the Departments of Chemistry, Physics, Biology, Law, for those of you who just might be interested in patent law, uh, I'd love to see all of you invent something, discover something, think about the entrepreneurial application of what you do. So how do we get you there? Well, you're going to have formal coursework, you'll have rotations and the like. The purpose of this is really to teach you how to learn, not what you will learn. Different ways of learning, different ways of listening to your colleagues, asking questions in a different way. Um, and encouraging you to become as independent as you can in the process that you take of asking fundamental questions uh, that are out there in the world around human health. So our job is to help you get to the point where you have that prepared mind. To quote Louis Pasteur, discovery favors those with a prepared mind. So good luck. I look forward to seeing all of you accomplish a whole lot. And uh, just because I'm a dean doesn't mean you can't be in touch. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Gerson. So a key component of the training here at Case Western is the involvement of the, the, the chairs and the faculty. And the link between that is a, a formal uh, a, a relationship with my office, the Graduate Education Office, and the department chairs. Um, the representative for the Council of Basic Science Chairs is uh, uh, really facilitates these interactions. And uh, Dr. Boron uh, currently is that position. Uh, he is the chair of physiology and biophysics. He's the David N. and, and Inez Myers Antonio Scarpa professor. He's also a distinguished university uh, professor, which again is the highest honor for a case faculty. Uh, Dr. Boris Boron also has the distinction of being a member of the National Academy of Medicine. His research focuses on how cells inter uh, regulate their intracellular pH and homeostasis through gas channels. It's a very active research program. Dr. Boron, look forward to your remarks. Well, Marvin, thank you. Thank you very much for the very kind words. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, all of the first year students, our new younger colleagues in the School of Medicine. And it's my, indeed my privilege to say a few words. I've been asked to give some inspirational words about medical research careers. And I'm gonna do this by asking a question first. Why are we, as educators and students in a PhD program in a school of medicine? And of course, the reason is that we're expected to make discoveries that eventually translate to patients and help them in terms of either preventing disease or treating the disease that they might have. And I'd like to illustrate illustrate how this can happen by giving a, a short anecdote that describes the pipeline uh, of discovery. And the pipeline consists of basic science research in a laboratory with water and cells and so on, molecules, translating that through experimental animals all the way to the point of eventually translating it to human patients and trying to cure them of a disease. And this story begins with a man by the name of Peter Agre, who has a strong connection to Case Western Reserve University. He was a medical resident here at University Hospitals and after finishing his training here in Cleveland, eventually went on to Johns Hopkins University where he was studying red blood cells and wanted to isolate the RH complex. And you may have heard of diseases that can occur in pregnant women who lack the RH protein and have babies, fetuses nevertheless, who have it and they could develop a disease in which the, the mom is rejecting the fetus. And so Peter Augury was trying to isolate that RH complex. And along the way, he discovered a protein that was unknown and had the courage to pursue uh, the study of what that protein was. And it turns out that this protein, after three years work of, of work, uh, starting in the late 1980s and extending through the early 1990s, it turns out that that protein was the world's first water channel. He at first didn't appreciate that it was a water channel. People had known that red blood cells had water channels. They didn't know what that protein was. And somebody made the suggestion that maybe this unknown protein could be that water channel. He cloned the DNA that encodes the water channel and named it finally aquaporin 1, the water pore number 1. This was in the early 1990s. Uh, in the mid-1990s, uh, people began to clone more and more aquaporins and eventually a group cloned something known as aquaporin 4. Aquaporin 4 turns out to be at the blood-brain barrier. This blood-brain barrier separates the blood and even though our bodies control the composition of blood pretty well, it's not well enough to control uh, the very special environment that's in the brain. And so this blood-brain barrier isolates the blood from the brain and keeps the brain more stable. And this aquaporin-4 is highly expressed in this barrier between the blood and the brain. And it's the way that water gets into the brain and out of the brain. And where this becomes medically important is it, we're on the year 2000, another group out in University of California in San Francisco made a mouse that's genetically deficient in aquaporin-4. And they realized that in this mouse, water could very poorly cross the blood-brain barrier. And then even a few years later, in the early 2000s, that same group used that knockout mouse as a model to demonstrate that in a model of stroke, 
where one of the real problems is something called cerebral edema where the brain and spinal cord can start swelling and can cause and accelerate death. They realized that knocking out the aquaporin 4 prevented that. In 2003, Peter Agre shared the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his discovery of the aquaporin. So that's the real basic science award, reward that Peter Agre received. But already the process had started to translate uh, towards the treatment of stroke. At about that time, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory by the name of Marc Pelletier came to me with the idea, let's start a little company and let's look for a small molecule inhibitor that might block aquaporin for to treat stroke. And so we started this company. This was back east and we moved to Cleveland in 2007, brought the company with us, went through a whole round of drug discovery, including medicinal chemistry, and finally arrived at a molecule which in mice and in rats prevents the swelling or greatly slows down the swelling of the brain in an experimental model of stroke. So that's the first step in the, the, the continuing saga of translating this to human beings. The next step is a series of so-called preclinical trials where the drug is deemed to be safe. And then finally, it goes through phase one human testing. And this drug about a year, a year and a half ago succeeded in its phase one clinical testing, which is for safety testing. And now the company is in the process of raising the capital to do the phase two testing, which will demonstrate whether or not this drug is efficacious in human beings. Now, we only have about a 50% chance of being uh, successful as an endeavor, but you can see that the whole process started in the late 1980s. It went through a series of basic science discovery, translational discovery. In the middle, there was a Nobel Prize. There's a company formed, capital raising in order to help the company move forward. And we're now in a position that maybe in three years or so, we may know whether this drug works, and maybe in the mid to late 2020s, it will find finally hit the market and help treat patients if indeed we're successful. Even so, we may fail. But that time course is well over 30, 35 years from the original discovery in a basic science lab, a group of people who didn't know what they were working with at the beginning, and then you, through a series of other investigators finally translating it to human beings and perhaps uh, someday we'll be able to help stroke patients by preventing the swelling of the brain that happens during uh, a stroke. You, as PhD students, may, uh, as you go through your careers and decide what it is that you want to be when you're finally independent, you may be that postdoctoral fellow that discovers the next aquaporin one. You might be the person at the NIH who funds the grants that help support that research. You could be an editor that helps publish the work that describes these, these research results. You could become a venture capitalist that helps invest the money to help make these things happen. Or you could be part of the FDA. There's so many different kinds of careers that one can have that help promote the movement of an idea through this pipeline from basic science to translational science to finally applications to human beings. And so you should be thinking of how you might fit into this system, but I think this story of Peter Agre and his aquaporins describes how a basic science discovery can potentially translate to humans and help uh, cure disease. And it's been a pleasure relating this short anecdote to you, giving you an illustration of how this translation might occur. And I wish you all the best of luck as you begin your careers as our junior colleagues here at Case Western Reserve University. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Boron. So as you can see, there's a, a wide range of things that you can do with your, your PhD. It's not just going and pipetting in, in the lab. I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, maybe we need somebody to figure that out. Anyway, um, um, so there are a wide range of things. As, as Dr. Boron mentioned, you, there's the, the whole continuum. And, and we, our goal here is to prepare you to be able to do any of those things. So next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. George Dubiak. Uh, Dr. Dubiak is a professor in physiology and biophysics. Uh, in addition to running his own lab that focuses on uh, innate immunity and, and cell signaling, he's the director of our Biomedical Scientist Training Program, or BSTP program. Uh, many of you have gotten to know Dr. Dubiak over the, over the um, last few months during the orientations. Um, if you haven't already, there's a couple of things you'll appreciate with Dr. Dubiak, and I'd just like to relate. Um, first, his knowledge of cell signaling. 
he's a true expert. Uh, he's one of these guys who's forgotten more about self-signaling than most people ever knew in the beginning. More importantly, he likes to, to share that knowledge with students. Um, on my count, I could be wrong, but uh, close to 200 PhD theses over the committees, over, the, over the, his time here at Case Western. So he's an excellent trainer, he's a trainer in many programs, and he's really committed to graduate education. So we're lucky to have him as the director of our uh, BSTP. George. Thank you, Marvin. Uh, so PhD la white lab coat ceremony, it's actually, there are 16 PhD programs that are represented here today that, that, that our students will be joining. Now, if, as both Dr. Gerson, Dr. Boron, Dr. Nie Neiman have indicated, you know, science is a collaborative process. And if nothing else, in the last 18 months of dealing with this pandemic, I think we realize how all of these 16 PhD programs and even others are all really come together to have a, a common goal, in this case, to, to both be able to diagnose, treat, uh, and, and control the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, you might say, uh, students who are in the audience now who are starting their careers who might be interested in, hey, this is a good time to be studying viruses and, and how we can deal with viruses, might say, I have to join the, the molecular virology PhD program. And that certainly is a, is a great option. But all of you, if you think to everything that you've been listening to for the last 18 months, terms like mRNA vaccines, spike protein, uh, receptor for spike protein, uh, cytokine storm. All of those are really the foci of, of many different PhD disciplines. And so because of that, we recognize that many of our, our new students really don't want to commit to a, a particular PhD program right now at the start of their program. They might be interested in molecular virology to study the virus itself, but they might be interested in using the tools of biochemistry and structural biology to actually study the spike protein or the structure of the antibodies that are directed against it. Or we're hearing about low, long COVID now. So long COVID also affects the, neuro, the, 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 the brain and, and, and the central nervous system. So they may want to study SARS-CoV-2 or COVID from the standpoint of the discipline of neurosciences. And that's the goal, or that's the rationale for programs, so-called umbrella programs, like the biomedical sciences training program. So over 30 of our new students today uh, have entered the program as a BSTP student. They're doing rotations in different laboratories with different faculties, and six months from now, in December, that's when they'll be choosing whether they're gonna be a molecular virologist or a neuroscientist or a pharmacologist or a geneticist. So 16 programs, we're gonna be starting alphabetically, certainly not alphabetically, but with certainly one of the foundational disciplines, the uh, PhD program in biochemistry, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the representative, uh, representatives of that program, uh, Dr. Bill Merrick and uh, Dr. Martin Snyder. Dr. Merrick is uh, representing uh, the chair of that department, Alan Deal, who can't be here today, and Dr. Martin Snyder is the uh, graduate program director of the Department of Biochemistry. So, biochemistry, you're gonna hear about how it contributes to PhD education. Hello everyone, I'm Martin Snyder. I'm the director of the Biochemistry PhD program and vice chair for education in biochemistry. Joining me today is Dr. William Merrick who wore both of these hats at the same time before I did. Our chair is Dr. J. Allen Deal who is traveling today and unfortunately can't join us. So biochemistry is the, the part of biomedical sciences that starts with a viewpoint of molecules first. We're interested in where they're made, how they're made, where they go, how they're broken down, what their structure is, who their friends are, what they interact with, what their function is, and of course overlying all of this is what happens when they work and also equally importantly what happens when, they don't, when, when things go wrong. So researchers in the biochemistry department are interested in infectious disease, in cancer, in the function of RNA, the application of modifications of the genome, development, and stem cells. 
Um, we're a vigorous group and, um, and we're growing, so watch for our ads if you're interested in a job. So I'd like to introduce uh, new students. The first of these is Colin J. Ballard. He joins us from the University of Cincinnati. Next is Jordan A. Griffith. He joins us from the University of Maryland, College Park. <laughs> Next is Joseph C. Schindler. He joins us from Middlebury College. He's new to the PhD program, but not new to Case Western Reserve because he's an MD PhD student who's um, already spent some time in the MD program. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob Kirsch. I'm the, the chair of the Department of Biomedical Engineering. I'm joined by the vice chair of our department, Horst von Rakem. Biomedical engineering is the application of engineering principles to solve problems in medicine and in biology. Our faculty and our students work in laboratories across the university and, in fact, across all of our medical affiliates here in town. They perform discovery research. They they develop diagnostic tools, and they develop treatments for medical conditions. Our areas of focus are in neural engineering and biomedical imaging, biomaterials and nanomedicine, and sort of big data analytics and health informatics. We also have a major program that helps the faculty translate the discoveries that they make in their laboratories into products that can improve uh, health. So I'm very pleased to welcome our new class of PhD students today. I wish you all success in your, in your endeavor. So I may need to do this. So our first student is Mehran Abata from the University of Rochester. <laughs> Next is Walid A. Abu Hashim from the University of Akron. <laughs> Next is Arpit Agarwal from the Delhi Technological University, India. Lydia Aquino from Makerere University, Uganda. <laughs> Rohan Baraha from the Maharishi Dhyanan University in India. Anubuti um, Bahulotia from the Rennesler Polytechnic University. <laughs> Sawika Bahre Watch from the um, MS Ramiya Institute of Technology, India. <laughs> and 
Andrew Choi from The Ohio State University. Rohan Damdire from the University of Pune in India. Lindsay Druschel from Case Western Reserve University. Brennan Flannery, Purdue University. <laughs> Haley Heidecker, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Rachel Jakes, Washington University in St. Louis. <laughs> Natalie Hong, Carnegie Mellon University. Projecta Joshi from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science in India. <laughs> Eric Liu, Washington University in St. Louis. Jonah Mudge, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Pushkar Muta, University of Pittsburgh. Margot Randolph, University of Washington. <laughs> Jordan Smith, Gannon University. Gazelle Tamasubi, Amakur Kaber University of Technology, Iran. <laughs> Elizabeth Wakeland, Purdue University. Yang Yang, University of California, Santa Barbara. <laughs> Yaha Zhang, Case Western Reserve University. Zi Yuan Zhang from the Yangzhi University of Traditional Chinese Medicine. <laughs> 
Thank you, and again, best wishes to everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Tony Winshaw Boris, and I'm the chair of the Department of Genetics and Genome Sciences. And joining me is Dr. Wa Lu, who's our program director of the PhD department. I'm proud to say that I'm a graduate of Case Western Reserve University with both an MD degree and a PhD degree in the Department of Biochemistry. So, genetics is the study of traits inherited through families while genomics refers to the use of the genome project to understand how all of the genes in our bodies work together in health and disease. Overall department mission is to pursue cutting edge research, provide state of the art clinical care, and to train the next generation of scientists, clinicians, and educators in all aspects of contemporary genetics and genomics. Our department is a bridge department between the School of Medicine and University Hospitals, consisting of both basic and clinical genetics and genomics. Additionally, our department includes faculty from all over the university, including the biology department at Case and the Genomic Medicine Institute at the Cleveland Clinic, in addition to, to the School of Medicine and uh, University Hospitals. We house a number of core facilities used throughout the School of Medicine, campus, and affiliated hospitals. We have an outstanding group of more than 30 faculty, primary faculty, and more than 35 secondary faculty with particular strengths in genetics, genomics, and whole genome analysis, neurogenetics, cancer genetics, epigenetics, model organisms for the study of genetic disease, small molecule and drug development, stem cells, including induced pluripotent stem cells, and we're the home of Cystic Fibrosis Research Center and the Research Institute for Children's Health. Besides our PhD program, we have a master's program to train eight uh, genetic counseling students per year, so a total of 16 students. So now I'd like to introduce our genetic students. Uh, first, Bijou Basu from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, next, we have Pinan Hu from Shanghai Ocean University, China. <laughs> next, Joseph Diamato Cass from Case Western Reserve University. Catherine C. Latai from Princeton University. <laughs> Jesse J. Zahn from Johns Hopkins University. So thank you, and good luck to all of you students, including especially our ones from genetics. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Ernie Reich from Microbiology and Molecular Biology. Welcome. Uh, I'm Arne Rietsch. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Microbiology. I'm representing our chair, Dr. Jonathan Karn, who unfortunately uh, couldn't be here today. And with me is Dr. George Dubiak, who is uh, standing in for Alan Levine, who is actually out, uh, um, out of town right now, our graduate program director. So the Molecular Biology and Microbiology Department, uh, you might imagine this is a very broad term, and uh, the research that uh, we conduct is uh, equally broad. So we have uh, researchers studying uh, bacterial um, cell biology, bacterial virulence. We have uh, uh, cancer researchers, people studying the microbiome, its uh, interaction with the gut uh, immune system. 
Uh, but we also have a very heavy emphasis on virology, in particular HIV virology. The Center for AIDS Research is housed in our department, but we also have researchers studying adenovirus. And of course, most recently, should I have taken this off? <laughs> COVID. <laughs> you get so used to it. <laughs> um, so it is my pleasure uh, to uh, introduce the students who are entering uh, our three graduate programs, uh, the first of which is cell biology. Um, with us today is uh, Cheyenne Foster, welcome. She's joining us from Cleveland State University, so just down the road. Next we have, uh, in the Molecular Biology and Microbiology program, Jordan D. Kress from Brigham Young University. <laughs> Rachel M. Gowen from Gonzaga University. Avinash Kaur Sandhu from the University of Maryland, College Park. <laughs> Farooq Senturk from Southern Connecticut State University. Oh, he's not here. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. It's apparently not here. So. We'll move to the molecular virology students. We have Inho Cha from the University of Rochester. <laughs> Ahmed El Sayed from Cairo University, Egypt. And uh, Ethan S. Honeycutt from the University of Virginia. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'd like to introduce uh, the Chair of uh, Molecular Medicine, Dr. Jonathan Smith. Hi, I'm Jonathan Smith, uh, the program director for the Molecular Medicine Program, which is run out of the Cleveland Clinic. And this is my associate director of our program, Justin Lafia. So the goal of the Molecular Medicine PhD program is to integrate medical knowledge into PhD training or, or to train the next generation of translational researchers within a supportive and inclusive environment. The most unique feature of our program is that each student, in addition to having a uh, research advisor, has a clinical commenter who uh, helps them in an independent study clinical experience. And another way that we introduce medical knowledge into our program is we have several MDs joining our program in a program within the program we call the PRISM program. And these are MDs who are doing their residency or fellowship and have protected time for research. And out of our 10 students this year, three of them uh, entering that way. Um, so every year I get to um, uh, witness the amazing transformation as our students enter, not sure exactly what they're going to be doing, and they transform themselves into really mature scientists who know how to test hypotheses and become masters of their specific research interests. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, uh, eight of our ten students this year. Uh, the first student is Dylan Davis from Wilkes University. Thank you, Dr. Smith. 
Next, I'd like to introduce Molly Guthrie from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Jamie Holman, MD, from Georgetown University. <laughs> next, I'd like to introduce William Horgan from Michigan State University. Uh, Chantel Little from Rochester Institute of Technology. Congratulations. Thank you. Kayla Mahan from Allegheny College. Lillian Markley from State University of New York, Fredonia. <laughs> and Erica Orsini, MD, from George Washington University. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lin May. I'm chair of neurosciences. And join me today is Dr. Heather Breuer. Director of Neuroscience PhD program. So what do we study? We study something very simple, something between our ears, the brain. So weighing about three pounds, the brain has 86 billions of neurons, and each of them have to make connection with 10,000 different neurons. Okay, and forming uh, extremely complex circuits that enable us to sense, such as hear and see, as you do now, and to think and to make decisions. So we study how the brain develops and how, they, how it functions and how it ages when we're getting old. When the, what happens when the brain goes wrong? People can go crazy, and patients may have Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, stroke, ALS, just to name a few. So we also study the pathological mechanisms of brain disorders. So we use all kinds of animal models, including mice and Drosophila. Okay, we use cutting edge techniques. We implant electrodes and record hundreds and thousands of neurons at the same time and when the animals performing complex behavior. So we try to tease out exactly how the brain or the circuits works. We're also using imaging techniques to see how the neurons fire the electrics activity, and et cetera. Okay. Um, 
So I would like to introduce uh, our uh, students. And the first one is Bianca De Freitas Brainier. And from Unicamp of Campinas, Brazil. <laughs> and next is uh, Keenan T. Hope, University, Maryland, Baltimore County. Raquel Lopez de Boa from Moravian College, Pennsylvania. <laughs> Jarek A. Ridbaum, Washington Jefferson College. Anika H. Wu from Emory University. <laughs> I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all the students, um, not just the neuroscience students. And also I'd like to introduce uh, Hope Makokas, the Chair of Nutrition, and David Lodowski, the System Biology. Thank you very much, and welcome, family, to this very exciting day. My name is Hope Arkukas. I'm the chair of the Department of Nutrition. And I want to thank Dr. Lodowski, who is our graduate program director. And he's obviously helping us today with the, um, uh, you know, the white coats. So the Department of Nutrition is home to 22 faculty with extraordinarily diverse research. Everything from at the molecular level, such as looking at to cough for all protein, to the community, you know, why are we dealing with food insecurity, and clinical interventions. We are also home to a number of educational training programs, not just at the undergrad level, but also at the master's level. We have one of the oldest master's degree program in the country, combining didactic with clinical training. And so without further ado, I'm really excited to introduce to you our students. And as Dr. Gerson said, there's so many different, the world is your oyster. I'm actually happy to say that both of our students are clinicians. They're both registered dietitians. First is Kate Undaff from Youngstown. Congratulations and welcome, Caitlin. Next, Aaron, Aaron Fletcher. And Aaron is from Toledo, the University of Toledo. <laughs> Congratulations again. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Cliff Harding, the chair of the Department of Pathology, and I'm joined here by my colleague, Sean Wei Zhu, who's the director of the Pathology Graduate Program. I'd like to extend a welcome to all of the entering students uh, who are our entering students, but also, as Dr. Boron noted, our new scientific colleagues. I'd also like to welcome the family and friends who provide such important support. Pathology is the study of disease. That's a pretty broad topic. It spans many areas of science and medicine. By studying the mechanisms of disease, we can translate that knowledge into diagnostics and into therapy. 
Our graduate program is actually uh, composed of three constituent training programs. Uh, one of them is the immunology training program led by Dr. Brian Cobb, who is also the principal investigator of our NIH training grant for that training program. Uh, another pathway uh, track in the program is our cancer biology training program, which is done in collaboration with our cancer center and is led by Dr. Mac Mark Jackson, who is also the PI of the NIH training grant that supports that program. And third is our uh, molecular and cellular basis of disease training program, which is led by Dr. Shang Wei Zhu, and he is also the uh, PI of our NIH training grant in neurodegenerative diseases. So I would now like to acknowledge our entering students, uh, the first of whom is uh, Alicia Aguilar, and I will say that this is a combination of students entering as uh, PhD students and as MD-PhD students in the Medical Scientist Training Program. <laughs> Next is Danielle Brown, uh, joining us from University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Next is Daniel Feinberg, joining us from Washington University in St. Louis. And next is Natasha Ingles, joining us from University of Puerto Rico, Maguez. Next is Hana Jun, uh, uh, joining us from Gashan University, South Korea. Next is Daniel Kingsley, joining us from Kent State University. Next is uh, Emily Kukin joining us from University of Pittsburgh. And another from the University of Pittsburgh, Blake McCourt. And next is Sarah McNear, joining us from Marietta College. Next is Kevin Newhall, joining us from Vassar College. Next is Vinicius Suzart, joining us from Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And next is Sabrina Wong, joining us from Johns Hopkins University. And I'll now introduce uh, Dr. Ed Yu, the Interim Chair of the Department of Pharmacology.
Hi everyone, my name is Edward Yu. I'm a professor and interim chair of pharmacology. And joining me is Professor uh, Jason Meir. He's the director of our pharmacology graduate program. Uh, what we are doing is we basically study drug-drug uh, interaction, right, and drug-protein interaction. Of course, we also study drug-disease interaction as well, right? The pharmacology department ha has enjoyed the tradition of excellency in scientific research and education. So several of our peerist pharmacology members were awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, which is the highest honor in our in our scientific arena, uh, which include uh, Earl uh, Sutherland for his discovery of cyclic M AMP, Tech Rail for his contribution to cyclic AMP and the adenosine receptor, L. Gilman uh, for his beautiful work on G proteins, and Ferret um, Murat for his discovery of nitric oxide signaling. So our PhD program is very rigorous and of course outstanding uh, in my mind. So we typically uh, bring in a small number of graduate students each year to our department. Uh, student and trainees uh, graduate from uh, our department have done really well in the past and uh, in, their scientific, in their scientific career and, uh, uh, and also many of them have become leader of the field as well. So today I'm so delighted that uh, we have two students joining us. Uh, uh, they are Sierra Cottons and Jessica Zurek. Uh, first, we have Sierra Cottons. Congratulations. The, the legs will be Jessica Zurek. Congratulations, Jessica. Then we will have physiology department and Dr. Waterboron. Good afternoon. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Corey Smith, who is a director of graduate studies in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. Physiology, in the three characters that describe it in the Chinese language, literally mean the study of the logic of life. In English, physiology is the study of function, and in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics, we dis study function from the level of individual atoms, through molecules and the way the proteins, for example, fold to cellular organelles like the mitochondria, intact cells like neurons, entire tissues like kidney tubules, entire organs like the heart, and indeed the entire organism like a mouse, and indeed we study intact living human beings. The areas of physiology that we're particularly interested in is neurophysiology, particularly neurodegeneration, the study of the heart and cardiovascular system, and the study of the kidney. Biophysics is the application of physical principles to life, particularly the optics, electricity and magnetism, mechanics, and so forth. So it's my pleasure to introduce you to three new PhD students in the Department of Physiology and Biophysics. The first is Tristan Karmachi from the University of Portland. The second is Emily Kruger from the University of Michigan.
And the third is Beverly Wood from San Francisco State University. And now I would like to introduce you to Jonathan Haynes, who's the chair of the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences. Jonathan. Well, hello and thank you all for, for coming. And my name is Jonathan Haynes. I am the chair of the Department of Population and Quantitative Health Sciences here at Case Western Reserve University. The department has 36 faculty and their activities in research and teaching span the spectrum from cells to society. We have expertise in molecular immunology of infectious diseases, functional genomics, genetics, genetic epidemiology and population genetics, epidemiology, biostatistics, bioinformatics, health services research, public health, and community and population health. We use a multidisciplinary approach to study many different human diseases, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, neurological disease, eye disease, as well as studying many different social determinants of health and how they interact with some of the biological factors. We lead or collaborate through many different centers and institutes, four of which are home, are in, in our department as their home, including the Cleveland Institute for Computational Biology, the um, Cl Clinical and Trans the um, International Center for Health Genomics, the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods, and the Swetland Center for Environmental Health. We work on numerous local, regional, national, and international con uh, consortia and collaborations, and with all our hospital affiliates. Covering this breadth of expertise really is impossible in a single PhD program, so we actually host and manage three different PhD programs. Our biomedical health informatics PhD program focuses on bioinformatics, taking advantage of the massive amounts of data generated uh, by the healthcare systems. Our clinical and translational science PhD program focuses on generating clinical research findings and translating them into practical use. And our epidemiology and biostatistics PhD program covers, in addition, obviously, to biostatistics and epidemiology, genetic epidemiology, health services research, and community and population health. We're delighted to welcome all of you and certainly the students in our department and to joining us, and we look we look um, forward to working closely with all of them and together and in person. So first I'd like to introduce Dr. Satya Sahu, who is the director of the Biomedical Health and Health Informatics Program and the students in that program. So um, the first student is uh, Carly Rose from uh, the University of Arizona. Next is Dia Young from Miami University. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Johnny Rose, who's the director of our clinical and translational science PhD program. and Jacqueline Shia, who's from George Mason University. And next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Williams, who's the director of our Epidemiology and Biostatistics PhD program.
And Jacob Rich will be uh, joining us from Eastern Michigan University. And uh, Yanning Wu from Capital University of Economics and Business. And I'd like to introduce Dave Ladowski, who is back doing double duty for the uh, Systems Biology program. Hi. Um, so we're the last ones, so you can breathe easy. So um, we're, we're sort of a different program. We're not a department. We're a program. So we really deal with the taking a computational and analytical approach to understanding the data that all these guys have produced. So um, you know, we have trainers in, I don't know, about 50-something trainers now. They're scattered all over the university and at, at the Cleveland Clinic and um, even some other places as well. And so anyway, we, have, we offer a kind of a really broad um, analytical approach to biology, from structural biology to population health to genetics and genomics to transcriptomics to virology. I've got somebody that does anything in the program. So without further ado, we'll, we'll start. So, uh, oh, sorry. And <laughs> so this is where I'm supposed, I'm supposed to be over here. So, um, so this is Gherkin Bebek. He's one of, our, one of our trainers in our program, and he's, he's doing the graduate program director job, which is what I usually do. So, <laughs> all right. Yao Asante. <laughs> Princeton University. Sorry, you have lots of names. So, Din Doi An Nguyen from University of Minnesota. <laughs> Megan Parks from State University of New York. Vive Pathic from University of Toledo and Case Western. Sorry, Syracuse. By the way. And I don't have anyone to introduce. So. Thank you, all the chairs, for coming and, and, and introducing the, the new students. This is great. So a couple of things. Uh, as you progress through your career at Case Western, uh, you're going to have many opportunities to serve in leadership positions, uh, whether it be at the School of Medicine or at the university. Uh, these provide experiences that you can take with you and, and engage and, and equip you for the rest of your career. Uh, I would like to recognize uh, Three students uh, who contributed to the School of Medicine with an extra effort and service over the past year. Uh, they're, they're, they were unable to come today, but uh, Brianna Buescher, who is in the, part, in the program of pathology, uh, she helped immensely with the recruitment and, and during the interviews uh, over the past year, which was had to be retooled and, and to a remote uh, uh, 
uh, operation last year. Anna Miller, she's in the Genetics and Genome Sciences program. Uh, she's had service at the Student Senate, the Biomedical uh, Graduate Student Organization, and helped with the Biomedical Graduate Student Symposium. And then finally, Matthew Plushinger, who's in the Pharmacology program. He's the past president of the BGSO. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Alyssa Hubel. To, uh, she is the current biomedical graduate student, uh, the president of the uh, biomedical graduate student. She is a second year student in the pathology program. Thank you and good e afternoon. I guess it's afternoon, evening, right? We're about 5.30 now. So again, my name's Alyssa Hubel. I'm a second year PhD student in the pathology department, and I'm the current president of the Biomedical Graduate Student Organization, or more often referred to as BGSO. So first off, I would like to say congratulations to all our newly matriculated PhD students in the biomedical sciences for your acceptance and brand new beginnings at Case Western Reserve University. It is because of your previous hard work dedication, and significant perseverance throughout difficult challenges you have faced, not only in the past year, but within the entirety of your professional and academic life that have prepared you for this next step in your academic career. The white coat ceremony is an incredibly important milestone, more so now than ever before. Over the past year, the field of biomedical research has suffered extreme scrutiny over the legitimacy and efficacy of the research and treatments presented to the public to address the current SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. As you step into your PhD training, you will now not only have the opportunity to conduct meaningful research that will contribute to the advances of science and medicine, but aid in the restoration of the public's trust and confidence in that research. As a member of the scientific community, you are and should be the biggest advocate of your scientific findings while still maintaining impartiality that will effectively communicate the truth regarding all scientific research. Congratulations on officially entering your first years of medical discoveries. You are now one step closer to your future career as scientists. Yeah. and you will make an active and meaningful change in this world. While the next years of your life will present challenges that deem difficult to overcome, remember that there are bigger and better opportunities ahead that make the challenges feel minuscule. The work you are doing matters and is vital to the betterment of society, which makes the rocky journey worth it. Today I'm here to speak on the behalf of BGSO, so BGSO is an organization that was created to unite graduate students from all biomedical programs of the Case Western Reserve School of Medicine, as well as integrate them into the School of Medicine as a whole. Our overall goal is to enrich the biomedical graduate education through career and professional development, as well as to form a unified community through social events on campus. I'm so excited to meet each one of you individually at future BGSO events, and I wish you luck in your coming years of your PhD. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time if you have any questions, and remember that we are here as a tool to aid you in your path to success. Again, congratulations, and thank you. So as we wrap up the ceremony, it would be, I want to take a minute to thank everyone in the Graduate Education Office for helping us pull this event off. To, uh, it's no small task to coordinate all of the students, the faculty, and, and, and the coats, the photographs, the PowerPoints. Um, Milana Bay. Uh, uh, Debbie Noradine is, I don't know where Debbie is, she's in the back there. And, and running the slides is Grace Filar. So. so we've spent a lot of time talking about what these uh, 
new discoveries are going to be, what they're all about. The people on this side of the room have probably heard a lot of words that they've never heard of before, and they say, what in the heck are they talking about? So you have a homework assignment. Next time you talk to them, you need to make them tell you what they're doing and in a way that you understand it. That's going to help them in their project. If they can understand what they're doing and explain it to someone who's not a scientist, that's going to further their career. They're going to really solid, uh, uh, focus in on what is, what is, why, why is their project important. So, so that's your job next time you, when they come home. and. Uh, they're not going to like it, but keep pressing them until you understand what they're doing. So it has been a tradition uh, to close this uh, ceremony with uh, someone f as a second year student. So this, uh, uh, this last year has been an unusual start to graduate school, just to put it mildly. Um, this year's closing remarks are going to be given by Taylor Baker. Uh, she's in the lab doctor of Dr. Ruth Carey in the pharmacology program. All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Taylor Baker, and as was said, I'm a second year student in the pharmacology department of, um, in the lab of Dr. Ruth Carey. So I cannot express how overjoyed and honor I am to stand in front of all of you in person to finally welcome you into the next stage of your life and career with friends and family nearby. It feels surreal to me to see your faces in real life rather than behind my computer screen. And I can imagine that feeling is amplified for all of you as you reflect upon everything that, you've, that has brought you here today. Each of you has faced insurmountable challenges to be here. You devoted yourself to your studies, your research, your extracurriculars, and your passions, building up your strengths and skills, advocating for your place in the scientific community throughout the entirety of this pandemic. Pause and take that in. I want to extend my most sincere congratulations to all of you for making it into these seats and joining the Case Western Reserve community. To be in these seats means that many accomplished scientists saw amazing potential during the application and interview process. They saw that you already started developing the vital skills you will need as a scientist, and your time here at Case Western will be filled with opportunities to enhance these skills, sharpen your knowledge, and open your minds. Although you will learn a plethora of skills and information during the next several years, I will try to summarize the big three things, or ingredients, if you will, that go into making a PhD scientist. And those are perseverance, flexibility, and drive. Perseverance is probably the most essential skill you'll need to succeed in the sciences. There will be times when your experiments are going well, your data looks amazing, and everyone is impressed by the time and effort you put into your work. However, you will struggle. Experiments will fail, your data will be unusable, and despite all the hours and effort you put into your classwork and your research, sometimes things don't work out always as you planned. In these moments, that bright, shiny PhD title at the end of that tunnel seems so far out of your reach. You might even feel a little bit of imposter syndrome, where you start doubting your skills and fearing that you're a fraud and who does not belong. When you find yourself in these situations, there are three things I want you to know. The first is that you are not alone. Every student finds themselves in these tough situations at multiple point, during multiple points to their journey to the PhD. For example, a fellow graduate student of mine has an entire lab notebook from her first two years entitled Data from when I had no idea what I was doing. And I think every student can relate to that in some way, shape, or form. Postdocs and faculty members also struggled too when they were going through this. A postdoc recently said to me, the first two to three years were rough. They were really rough for me. All the data that I gather was a mess. But you need to realize one thing. You are learning. You're going to make mistakes. You're, you're going to have to try things one, two, three, four, five times before it actually works. It's completely normal and to be expected. So please rest assured that you are not alone. The second is that you will persevere. Reflect on your perseverance and success you've achieved so far. Up until this point, you've applied to graduate school during a pandemic, uprooted yourself, replanted in Cleveland, and overcame so many obstacles to get yourself here today. You will push forward, trying that experiment again the fourth, fifth, sixth times, whatever it takes. I know this because you've already shown that you have the raw willpower to persevere. And thirdly, please remember that you do belong here. The road ahead is challenging, but it you will reach the end of that tunnel. 
You have the support of friends, peers, family, and faculty, as well as your Case Western community. We are, to here, we are here to help you uncover how much you can do and remind you that you do belong here. Flexibility. Flexibility or adaptability is another vital skill you'll need as a graduate student. During the course of your first year alone, you will have three plus rotations, take six or so classes, pick a new lab, learn new skills, form your research questions, and all the while getting acquainted with new people, new peers, and hopefully new friends. This all sounds daunting, for it appears that there are not enough hours in a day to accomplish it all. Frankly, there are not. But you will find a way to find stability in your class and lab work while also starting your life as young adults in a new city. Having the ability to adapt and pivot your attention to what needs it most is an important skill for graduate life and beyond. I have no doubt that all of you are capable of adapting to these new demands and lifestyles, allowing for you to create both a satisfying career and life here at Case Western Reserve, where you're surrounded by people who want to help you accomplish both. And thirdly, drive. In order to succeed in science, there has to be something that drives your success. Think to yourself, what motivates me? What makes me want to get up every day, be in my lab at odd hours, and willingly read what seems like an endless sea of scientific articles? I will let you in on a little secret. All scientists have the same drive, and that is impactfulness. We want to see how what we do and what we love not just challenges our own intelligence and growth, but how we can transform everything we do into an answer or solution society desperately needs. You will seek answers to overcome some of society's biggest health concerns. Perhaps you'll ask yourself, how can I better understand protein misfolding to improve our knowledge in Alzheimer's disease progression? What drugs can we develop for cancer patients who have grown resistance to all the drugs we already have in our pharmacological arsenal? How do I engineer a brand new nanotherapeutic that specifically delivers a piece of mRNA into immune cells, completely revolutionizing how humankind thinks of vaccines? The last one has already been answered and is the reason why you and I had the pleasure to see each other's faces again. But that's what I'm talking about. These scientists drive and their love of science was so groundbreaking and so earth shattering that there is some hope to this pandemic. Do you think that Dr. Hamilton Bennett or Dr. Kosmika Corbett, the leading scientists in developing the COVID-19 vaccines, thought they'd literally save the world during their white lab coat ceremony? My guess is probably not. But what they did have was a drive to make an impact. And that's what you all share. You're already on your way to leaving your mark here at Case Western Reserve and on the world. And I am so excited to see what you can do. Again, congratulations and welcome to Case Western Reserve. Thank you all so much for your attention and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. You can uh, grab a parking voucher and a cupcake on the way out. Mm -hmm.